Welcome to Mortification of Spin, a casual conversation about things that count with Carl Truman and Todd Pruitt, a podcast of the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals. Let's join this week's conversation. You are listening to Mortification of Spin. My name is Todd Pruitt. I'm the pastor of Covenant Presbyterian Church in Harrisonburg, Virginia, and it's great to be with you, and it's great to be joined, as always, by my friend Carl Truman, who is a professor at Grove City College out in western Pennsylvania. Carl, good to see you today on this uh, summer afternoon. Uh, What's the weather out there like in western PA today? Sunny, 72 degrees, low humidity. Absolutely nice. perfect. I'm going to be hitting my bike as soon as we're over today, getting out on the, uh, the lanes on my road bike. Yeah, so well, it's a rather it, it's a rather hot day here in the Shenandoah Valley because I think we're getting up to the upper 80s. So it's 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 that's that's pretty warm uh, summer day for for the Shenandoah Valley, which brings us to our guest today, Carl, because our guest lives in a region that I'm quite familiar with. I was raised there. And living there is a bit like I imagine what it would be like living on the surface of Mercury. And uh, our guest is uh, Fred Greco, who is the pastor of Christ Church Katy, which is uh, in the Houston metropolitan area, a congregation of the PCA. Fred, what's the weather out there in Houston like today? Well, Todd, today is going to be a cooler day than the rest of the week. We're only going to get up to 99 today. Oh, that is so cool. That's, that's refreshing. Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's fantastic. I, I I, don't miss any of that at all. But I will, I will let me say this for our friend Fred. Uh, Fred, who is a native of uh, uh, Buffalo, New York, which is, I, I think, the, the coldest spot on the surface of the earth, and uh, also a student from Michigan, all the kinds of things. He he actually likes this hot weather down in Houston. Um, he's he's okay with it. So I I I, I applaud your flexibility, uh, Fred. Yeah. So my wife uh, Deb, who is a alumnus of Grove City College, That's class right. of ninety two, um, she grew up in Buffalo and absolutely hates the cold. And I have told her. <laughs> This is about as far south as I can move her and still speak English. So we're 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 as warm as we can get. So I'm, right. I'm you, you you could go to Australia. Oh, this is true. That's even this further is true. south. Than, that uh, is a little further stuff. south. Yeah, yeah. Well, Fred Greco, our our guest, has a has the distinction of having been elected and then serving as the moderator for the fiftieth. General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church in America. The PCA is 50 years old uh, this year, having had its first General Assembly in 1973. And uh, I'm just going to say, as as a commissioner to General Assembly, um, I I have never seen a moderator so enthusiastically lauded with praise as Fred Greco. (laughs) And because uh, Fred has has kind of this unique ability. He has Robert's rules, rules of order somehow imprinted on his mind. It's like, it's like an internal Rolodex he has. And I mean, we, we began the conventions, uh, the, the, the assembly's business on Wednesday morning. And I think we were done like two hours later. I mean, the whole thing was over at that point. I, I, I'm exaggerating, but only slightly, um, Fred, great to have you, um, in all seriousness, um, that was an honor to uh, to be able to serve as as the moderator for the 50th General Assembly, wasn't it? It absolutely was. Um, I've thought about being moderator for several years and wasn't sure if it was going to happen and decided to, to run this year and was blessed to be elected. And if anyone watched either live or on the live stream, I will confirm for you that, yes, I had the time of my life. That's about <laughs> as nerdy as it gets, but um, I just... Uh, I loved it. And so one of the highlights of my life now will be becoming not only a meme, but several memes. <laughs> That's right. That made their way through uh, the internet. Uh-huh. And so, um, yes, I just, I, I really enjoyed it. I thought the assembly um, went extremely well, not just from mm-hmm. a business and a time perspective, 
But one of the things that I encouraged the assembly uh, at the very outset when I was elected was to ask them to be gracious and be mindful of the of the historical nature of the assembly. And even though we had disagreements and good debate, it was not rancorous at all. Yes. Uh, the brothers were uh, gracious to each other, listened to each other. There were no shoutings. There were no periods of chaos. Um, I was really thankful for that, that we were able to uh, show that out for the world. Because yeah. that's hard when you've got 2,200 voting commissioners plus. Right. right. You know, Fred, the thing I noticed, uh, and, and I agree completely, and one of the things I noticed was, you know, over the last five years especially, you know, we've had some pretty steep arguments in the PCA. We've had some real controversy, so much of it stemming back to the to the revoice thing from 2018. And, and because of that, as well as then uh, connected issues, we've had some we, we've had some pretty rancorous moments um, at General Assembly over the last five years or so. And and one of the things that so many of us commented on this year was that there, there was much more peace and much more respect um, for one another than we when we've seen in a while. And that was a that that was a blessing. And I, and, and particularly so, um, given the fact that we were giving thanks for, you know, 50 50 years now. Um, let me, let me ask you this. Uh, if, if, and I'm, and I'm sure you've been asked this in, in a number of different ways. Somebody asks you, you who've been in the PCA for a long time now. Um, what, um, did, did you leave this year encouraged? Now it's a bit of a softball question, but it's an important one because I've been asked that repeatedly. What's your answer? Yeah. So I think the short answer is yes, but to give some perspective, I've been now in the PCA as long as I've been married, which is approaching 27 years. We've got our 27th anniversary next month and came out of the Reformed Baptist world into the PCA outside Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, the PCA has been rough and tumble with a lot of different controversies over worship, over women in ministry, uh, over any number of things. And I think really over the last few years, what we're seeing is a PCA General Assembly that is more representative of the PCA as a whole. You know, of course, we have the opposite kind of assembly that Carl has with the OPC. They have a delegated assembly with mm -hmm. a limited number of people. Ours is anyone who could pay the fee can go, basically. Yeah. And so, for example, the last time that the assembly was in Houston, I think 2014, we had about 1,100 commissioners. Mm -hmm. This year, we had just shy of 2,300. Yeah. And what if everyone who could go did, did go, we'd have like seven or eight thousand. Right. So what you're seeing is a broader participation from small churches, from ruling elders. That participation is up. And I've really been encouraged about that. You know, there were a lot of men who came to me five or six years ago saying we need to start yet another new denomination. Uh, you need to be involved with this. We need you to set up the administrative committee. You could be the state of clerk. You can set up the <laughs> retirement benefits. And they had all kinds of work for me to do. Right. <laughs> I kept saying, no, we need to stay the course Yeah. because the PCA is a healthy denomination and we're going to see this. Mm -hmm. And I think we, we've seen that the last few years and we especially saw it this year. You know, not yeah. only was the debate gracious and respectful, most of the votes we're not even close. Right. Which showed a fundamental unity. There were really only two issues that weren't passed like 80 20 or 90 10. Right. There were significant issues that we could talk about maybe in a bit, yep. but almost all of the other issues, including some that could be considered a little bit controversial, mm -hmm. were passed by overwhelming numbers. Yeah. Which makes me see that there is a foundational unity to the PCA and that her demise has been uh, too quickly proclaimed. Yeah. Yeah, I was very I, encouraged. And I'm, as I've said on other places, I'm very bullish on the PCA. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I one agree. of the things that, that I hear from sort of outside the PCA, Fred, is really that it's it's very much a Southern denomination, that, that, that when the chips are down, it's the Southern guys who really uh, carry the day. And that's been the way it's been presented to me is it's, it's one of the redeeming features that uh, some of the crazy stuff or the crazier stuff takes place outside of the South. But when it comes to the General Assembly, the Southern guys uh, sort of in lockstep closed it down. Is that still the case? Or do you think that the the PCA is becoming, 
you know, is this unity that you're seeing, uh, perhaps it's always been latent now coming to the surface, is it, is it reflective of a, of a national unity or is it reflective of the fact that certain geographical areas are flexing their muscles and, and not allowing other geographical areas? To... I'll give you a little bit of background. I've, I've wondered, I've sometimes wondered, you know, does Presbyterianism, can it work over a large geographical area if there aren't very many people, e.g., the OPC, uh, <laughs> or can it work with a higher proportion of people over a smaller geographical area, e.g. Scotland, where it was kind of invented in the first place? Mm -hmm. uh, and the PCA has always struck me as interesting that you have a large number of people over a large geographical area. Do you think there is broad geographical unity, or is it just that some geographical areas are now carrying more power at General Assembly or flexing their muscles in a way that they perhaps didn't for a decade? Yeah, that's a really good uh, question, Carl. I think that the PCA has become more national since I've been in it in the last mm -hmm. 25 years. There certainly is a center of gravity in the southeast. Georgia, South Carolina, Alabama, Mississippi, Florida, they account for a large number of PCA mm. churches. But the PCA has really expanded and has become much more national. You know, you may remember the controversy in the PCA under uh, the federal vision. Oh, yeah. When, when that came out, I was one of a group of men who were being very public about the dangers of the federal vision. And one of the criticisms of our group was that we were just a bunch of Southerners. To which, I've heard that criticism Italian, on other issues as well. Yeah, <laughs> which, as an Italian from Buffalo, New York, <laughs> drunk me um, and so, you know, when I joined the PCA in 1996, I was a part of a presbytery called Great Lakes Presbytery, which encompassed all of Michigan, almost all of Ohio, all of Indiana, and all of Kentucky. That area now has about six or seven presbyteries in it, to give you an idea of the multiplication in the Midwest. Yeah. And so I think the PCA has grown, especially in the Midwest and in the Atlantic states. We still have areas where we're underrepresented on the West Coast. Uh, the mountain states are very mm -hmm. sparse. But I think through church planning efforts, um, the PCA has really become less culturally Southern and more um broad um you know just the fact that i was elected moderator you know as i said a, you know a buffalo guy who lives in houston uh and m the the other gentleman who was nominated who is not a founding father of the pca but one of the most um the greatest blessings to the pca uh, randy pope who founded a perimeter church in atlanta so just to give you an idea it's not like just if you're southern or just if you're from atlanta you can get what you want um mm -hmm. uh, I think the PCA has become broader. There's still work to do, but it's not the the church it was in the 80s, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that, and that's my perception um, as well. Um, and, and certainly, you know, center of gravity. Yeah, but you know, it would make sense. I mean, the the, the PCA was born in the South, um, but 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 the growth um, is has been you know, quite, quite remarkable in, in, in that regard, in terms of, of geographical coverage, but, you know, Carl, I mean, you and I have talked about this. I mean, I think you make a, I think you make a really good point uh, about how Presbyterianism, you know, was originally, you know, designed to work, envisioned to work on, on an Island, you know, um, and, and it is a challenging. third of an it, Island, actually. It, it, a, a third of an, of an island. island, right, exactly. You take out England and Wales. We always Katrina have to take would say the Wales, most beautiful right? third of the island. It, but just without a doubt. The island. Without a doubt it is. Me, me being a, a Scotsman as well. Um, but, uh, but I, I, um, I, I, there, there's no doubt there are significant challenges to having real connectedness with all that that means, like mm -hmm. including discipline over such a large period of time. But one of the things that, and Fred, I'm not going to ask you to get into the details on this because people's eyes might start to glaze over, but, but there were a couple of important things that happened um, at this year's GA that, that weren't quote, you know, sexy things, but were important in terms of kind of reasserting our grassrootedness right. and, and reminding our denomination that we are not a, a denomination that is run by committee, but committees are to serve at the discretion of the assembly. And there were a couple of important things 
that um that i don't know reasserted that yeah i mean is yes. that how you would describe it yeah yeah i mean there was one of the one of the longest and most technical debates was a debate over the report of our reform university uh fellowship or ministries mm -hmm. and they're proposing of a new affiliation agreement as to how they will operate with presbyteries and um that was a challenge mm -hmm. uh, because there there were a lot of technical questions and back and forth. And it was interesting. I don't know if this has happened before, uh, Todd, or if you've seen this, Carl, but after the vote was over and the ruling was made, I was asked the same version of a question about what that vote meant <laughs> literally eight times. Yeah. I went back, and looked at the tape yeah. eight times over and over and over again. Yeah. And I just kept repeating myself. Um, and I think it came out well because, you know, we have committees, not commissions. Right. Those of you that are studying for nation exams know the difference between a committee and a commission is a committee can't take action. It just reports. Um, and yet at the same time, I think there's a healthy trust for our committees to do the work. We don't mm -hmm. expect to have four general assemblies during the year to do the work during the year. So, you know, I think that was helpful uh, and healthy, and I, I think it'll end up in a good place. Yeah. But I think it was a reminder to people who might be new to Presbyterian structure that um, the courts of the church are the ones who act, and the committees serve, you know, at the pleasure of the courts of the church. Right, right. Fred, one of the things that some of our folks have no doubt seen if they spend much time on social media is that... Um, uh, well, it's clear now since their General Assembly that PCA does not care about abuse victims. Um, and we've seen this from, you know, some of the typical sources. Um, wh why were those accusations being made? I, I think it's a it's a way of looking at particular motions, resolutions, mm -hmm. overtures and predetermining what is the good and what is the not good outcome. Yeah. And one of the, the geniuses of Presbyterianism, which I think makes it harder as you get in a bigger geographical area, Carl, is that Presbyterianism slow. Yeah. That's a feature, not a button. <clears throat> right. To do things slowly and to do things the right way. And so, you know, we had some, some overtures that were, not passed, were sent back to the presbytery for refinement, and people acted like the sky was falling. Now, what yeah. people didn't report was that we passed uh, an overture. In order for something to become a part of our constitution, it needs to pass one general assembly, and then two-thirds of the presbyteries, kind of like two-thirds of the Senate, mm -hmm. and then a second general assembly. So it's hard to amend the constitution. You can't just do anything. Well, we had a uh, an amendment that passed its second general assembly in Memphis. Right. And that was a significant mm -hmm. move to protect the rights of those who are victims of abuse and those who find it difficult to deal with church process. Yeah. So we, we allowed courts, for example, for the first time to not have abuse victims uh, be in the same room as their, as the accused. We've, we've allowed the use of video testimony technology, the way that civil courts have done that for some time. Uh, we made several significant strides. The problem is it took two years to get that right. finalized. And by the time it gets finalized, everybody's forgotten about it. <laughs> yeah. I would argue that that amendment was more significant than any of the other amendments that were up. Right. And so you can't really argue we weren't sensitive to victims because we actually were and passed something. Right. And I think that's really significant. Yeah. The other thing is, is that, as you know, in the work of the church, not everything is done by flash and resolution. And so, you know, there are other efforts that are involved, you know, in addition to being the moderator and being on our standing judicial commission, which is kind of the PCA Supreme Court. Uh, I have been asked by the state of clerk's office to work with some other churchmen to kind of put together a simplified guide for uh, potential victims of abuse to how to use our system of government so that they're not having to interpret the BCO 
Yeah. You know, initially to guide them through what our charges, what is evidence, what are witnesses, what are complaints, what are appeals. And so, again, that's not announced on you know, Fox News or MSNBC, right. but that is in the works. And that's going to be a substantive help, a great mm-hmm. substantive help. Yeah. Um, I think finally, there's a sense in which people who aren't used to church process don't understand it. And, and that's, you know, I, I joke, my wife is the mathematician. She got her math and computer science degree from Grove City. And anytime something math related comes up, I say, ask my wife. I don't want to do the math. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't want to get into the weeds on that. And so it, it's similar with this. So, you know, we had an overture about who can be, who can testify. And people were up in arms because, for example, you might not be able to have a professed atheist testify. That's our current rule. But that doesn't stop, you know, a witness doesn't have to be a person. Right. It could be a document. It could be a fingerprint. It could be a science report. It could be a police report. It could be any number of things. It doesn't have to be a Christian testifying. So right. if you looked at that failed overture and said, the PCA only wants to hear from other Christians and it's not going to consider any other evidence, you're just wrong. Right. Ecclesiastically. Um, and so, you know. I think sometimes we look at things quickly. I'm learning not to make snap decisions when I see something on the news or on social media, Mm -hmm. because I don't have all the facts. Yeah. And so um, I'm learning to kind of scale back a little bit. Right. Facts are so overrated, I think, Fred. Uh, <laughs> life is so much more boring when you actually pay attention to the facts. Uh, right. I remember a yeah. couple of years ago, uh, 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 what became a sort of notorious incident in the OPC where uh, a young minister was actually suspended and, and the OPC took the unusual action of immediately suspending him. Normally, when you suspend a pastor, uh, he can appear to automatically appealed and the suspension is withheld until uh, the appeal has been heard. And the presbytery took the unprecedented, almost unprecedented step of immediately suspending this man and depriving his wife, his pregnant wife at the time, of health insurance. Mm. Um, that's a pretty severe penalty. Uh, I'm not questioning the church's judgment here, but what was interesting was how this was played in social media about how the church didn't take uh, the discipline case seriously. Well, you know, we, we don't have the right to imprison people or execute them. Right. Uh, right. You know, there are only certain things. We're not a criminal court. Yeah. There are only certain things we can do relative to, to the ecclesiastical situation. And it struck me at the time that it's quite bizarre that people had missed the, the very significant move in immediately imposing this penalty, yeah. which was the sort of the maximum extent of the law. And there was nothing else we could uh, I say we because I was not involved in in, right. in the decision, but there was nothing else that the OPC had at its its disposal. Well, it was, it was kind of the the equivalent of you know ecclesiastically speaking, kind of the equivalent of a guillotine, and yeah. yet the OPC was trashed because they didn't do enough to the guy. Good yeah. grief! Yeah, so it's interesting. Yeah, the other interesting. Thing yeah. That I think people miss in this debate is the spiritual nature of the church, which you pointed out, Carl. So. Mm-hmm especially in instances of abuse allegations. When I advise anyone, I tell them the very first thing they should do ecclesiastically is nothing. That they should not interfere with a police and a civil magistrate investigation. They should not corrupt witnesses. They should they should allow justice to be done. Yeah. And then quite frankly, if someone is found guilty um, at the civil magistrate, that makes the ecclesiastical case pretty easy. Yeah, because you just yeah. produce that as evidence, and yeah. so it's not a lack of caring; it's actually an evidence of care. Yes, yeah, slowly, yeah. and to let the civil authorities, who can jail people, who can yeah. remove people from areas where they could cause danger, to do their job. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Well, it's oh, been hold it, hold it. Bef- great. Before we wrap up, Carl. I'm getting instructions from central control here, man. But if you want well, to well, override t- them. Uh, 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 listen, you and I are the star. <laughs> We're the talent, Carl. <laughs> okay. Well, keep it short then, man. Okay. Keep yeah. It short so, so I don't get w- into trouble. <laughs> one thing, Fred, um, uh, and, and this this made Fox News, I think it made USA Today, uh, this whole idea that that as a denomination, we had a, we had an overture to petition governments, uh, the government, state and, uh, and federal governments uh, to to 
to to stop you know transgender surgeries um uh, it passed uh, well what you, what you did as moderator you you appointed a committee or a commission to draft I'm a, appoint a commission yeah, commission. going to appoint a commission to draft a statement. Now, there were a lot of no votes for us to do that, and a lot of people were wondering why. Um, and and uh, and it goes to just kind of how we understand uh, the church's involvement right. in in uh, in in petitioning the government. As the, the Reformed churches, you know, particular Presbyterians have said, you know, we need to be we need to be very careful to to you know not do that too often but but there are certain circumstances that are significant enough and extraordinary enough that they do raise rise to the occasion that we need to to speak that, into those issues right. let me see if i can answer this very quickly yeah the church is to be the church and to speak to the law of god and moral matters it shouldn't yeah. be making pronouncements on tax policy right. or immigration or defense policy right but it can speak to moral issues so for example the church has spoken on abortion for example before yeah. You'll note that this letter, this letter to be written to the civil government is solely on the matter of medical and surgical transitions of minors. It's very right. narrow. It's not on the transgender issue writ right. broad. We're, we're not going to send them copies of Carl's book, yeah. although I think many of them could benefit from that yeah. um, because it's, it's a very narrow issue on what's called a case extraordinary by our confession, chapter 31, paragraph four. And so- um, those who voted against it, I don't know a soul who is pro medical transitioning procedures for minors in the PCA. Right. right. I don't know one man who's come out publicly in that way. Mm -hmm. But the, those who voted against it are just trying to preserve the nature of the church and the spirituality of the church. And Christians have differed about this through the centuries right. on significant issues, slavery, abortion, um, all sorts of things. And so you shouldn't interpret that at all as being uh, divisive on the substance. Right. But I'm glad that we have a healthy debate about what the church is and how it should intervene in civil affairs. And so uh, just want to be you know, yeah. very clear about that. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. That's good. Well, Carl, I'm going to turn it over to you to wrap up. But I do want to say <laughs> this, Carl, that um, we, we, we ha we've, had, we've had several very good years in the PCA. Um, we, we just came off of a very successful and encouraging general assembly. If at any time you want to come over, we, we would, we would, we would give serious consideration to letting you join the PCA. All I would say, if I can, uh, well, the, the words that come to my mind, uh, uh, I may at some point lose my faith, but I suspect I will never lose my mind. <laughs> so, so. <laughs> So anyway, it's been a great pleasure to sit and listen to the triumphalism of my uh, brothers in the PCA. Uh, wonderful to know that everything's going perfectly and there are no clouds on the horizon whatsoever. Uh, almost enough to make me a post-millennialist. If it wasn't for the plain teaching of the word of God, I think I could almost be there at this point. But seriously, thanks very much for joining us, Fred. It's been very interesting to hear your insights in the PCA. It is very encouraging. Uh, as a Presbyterian a Christian, to know that things in the PCA are, 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 are smoothing out, it seems, at this particular point in time. I feel that when uh, each of our denominations plunges into chaos or to controversy, we all suffer. We're all part, ultimately, of the same body. So it is great to know that there was a, a great spirit of unity. And, and even among disagreements uh, this year, it was charitable and constructive. So it's a delight to uh, have heard that report from you, Fred. Uh, anybody listening who perhaps uh, is intrigued by Presbyterian polity or, or, or wants to know how Presbyterianism, at least in theory, uh, should work, we have a giveaway. If you visit our website, mortificationofspin.org, we have a number of copies of a great little book. Uh, by Guy Prentice Waters, professor at Reformed Theological Seminary, uh, How Jesus Runs the Church, which for my money, I think, is the is the most concise and the clearest explanation of the Presbyterian form of church government, what it can and cannot do, what it does and does not look like that is available today. While you're at our website, uh, if you feel led, please do make a donation. We are a listener-supported podcast. And otherwise, all that remains for me to say is to thank Fred once again for being with us. Thank you all for listening to us and say we look forward to being with you again in two weeks' time. Well, look at me, I'm a back again. I got a taste of love in a simple way. And if you need to know while I'm still standing, you just fade away. 
Thanks for listening to Mortification of Spin, a podcast of the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals. For more on topics like this, visit mortificationofspin.org, where you can find other articles by Carl and Todd, browse the archive of past episodes, and make a donation. We'll talk to you next time on Mortification of Spin. Mortification of Spin.